Hi folks, this is the very first episode of the 2022 The Town Talks podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by Longford Town legend, one of the few who've gotten a testimonial at Flancare Park slash Bishop's Gate, Sean Prunty. Sean, you're very welcome. Cheers, James. Look, thanks a million for uh, having me on. I'm really looking forward to this chat. It's always good, obviously, you know, to, to get uh, legendary players back uh, to, to have a chat about all things Longford Town. Um, but, you know... It's, a, it's not always easy to keep up with your former clubs when, when you're out and about and life comes at you and, and work and everything else. But have you been following the town a lot lately? Yeah, yeah I have indeed. Um, and I, I suppose there was a period of time where I just literally just didn't follow any football whatsoever. Um, but, you know, I always keep an eye on, on how the town are doing over the course of the season and, you know, the comings and going and with managers and players and all that. So, um, and I know this is this sort of quite a, a hectic time of the year in terms of pre-season and players pre coming in, players leaving. But uh, no, I'd always keep I'd always keep an eye out um, for Longford Town. I spent you know seven years down there, had a great career, um, better than I expected to be honest with you. We we had a, a real purple patch as a, as a team when um, Alan Matthews was manager when we won the cups, but also when Stephen Kenny was there. So like he got Stephen, I think had got. Um, really got the ball rolling and, and built up momentum for fans to come in and support Longford Town. So, but I, I would definitely keep an eye out on the club and, and hopefully this season is going to be a successful one for them. We'll go all the way back to, to the start. Um, obviously, you went over to, to Middlesbrough and you came home. Um, a lot of town fans don't realise this because they know from speaking to them, but you actually ended up in, in Shamrock Rovers first when you got back. How did, how did that come about and what happened there? So when I returned from England, I, I became like many other lads. I came back disillusioned from the game. There was no structure really in place for the guys coming back from, from the UK. So I literally just went into a job and the, the closest job was a, you know, working in a sports store. Um, and an old manager of mine at Belvedere had asked if I'd go out and train with them and with, with Shamrock Rovers. And I did. And they were training out in Donnybrook at the time. They did great. Like Damien Richardson was the manager. They had a really strong under-21 squad and I sort of fitted into that bill as well. So I was going training with them a couple of nights of the week and then after that, it was just, my, my heart wasn't in it, um, you know, at, at the time. But like I did played a couple of under-21s for, for Rovers and like a super, a super club, great tradition. Back then, they had a fantastic squad, like, um, you know, they did, and a really good manager. Um, and look, young, good young players coming through. Shane Robinson and all was on the the, the twenty ones as well uh, while I was there. But um, yeah, it just didn't materialize. It wasn't it wasn't the right time for me. Um, you know, it, I just my head wasn't in the game at all at that period of time. Do you think it was maybe too soon? You know, coming home and jumping straight back into a setup and and just trying to you know continue on playing, whereas you had kind of just dealt with a bit of rejection as a young person and. and you kind of jumped into the next thing that came at you and then all of a sudden you were kind of like, this isn't for me, you know, I need to get out. Yeah, I think I really done it because the manager had coached me at Belvedere. So I was more or less going to help him out and do uh, to do him a favour. Um, and he was trying to get me back involved in football, you know, so he was trying to do his job. But at that time, it, you know, I, I, I felt I'd given a huge amount of football as a kid go, growing up. The UK didn't work out for me. These things happen. But at that time, you know, like you feel that the world is ending. You know, you thought to feel like a, a bit of a failure. Um, but it, it, I definitely became disillusioned with the game. And it was just, it was, it was just down to, I suppose, probably my attitude. I didn't have, I didn't know where to turn, I had no education. And it, and, I, and I think any for any young player now, particularly going across the water, you know, football is great. And if you make it even better. But there always has to be a, a plan B or plan C. You know, injury could happen. You might not make it across in the UK. So having some sort of education behind you um, is vitally important. And I didn't have that. So, um, you know, for me, it was always going to be football. You know, I, I fell out of love with it. And then when Stephen Kenny took over at Longford Town, um, he managed to rope me back into uh, playing football again. Just on that, I think that story is nearly infamous now. It's been told so many times about how, how Stephen nearly, you know, dragged you kicking and screaming into the setup. Um, just just talk us through that in a little bit, because um, I know it is quite a good story of, of how he got you in. Yeah, so similar to when I came back, I was working in Champion Sports up on Grafton Street, and the 
he he had been calling uh, he'd been calling the store and I I didn't know Stephen Kenny and um, he Stephen anyone that knows him now he's meticulous when it comes to uh, player detail even when we were at Longford Town and we were playing in in Europe played Lovage for example he knew everything about the opposition and um, but he he was he was ringing the store. And, you know, eventually he was pretending to be, I, I was basically saying, I didn't want to talk to anyone, but eventually, as, as it goes, um, he was very, he basically just says, oh, it's uh, Sean's dad on the phone. So when I came down and uh, held up the phone, I was like, hello. And he's like, Sean, don't hang up the phone. Uh, it's Stephen Kenny here. I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, he said, look, just meet with me. Um, we have a chat and see, see where it goes. So what happened was, is that I planned to meet him out in Liffey Valley. And he said, okay, well, I live just around the corner. Do you fancy? He says, uh, you know, I'll pick you up at Liffey Valley, come around and, you know, you know, we'll have a chat at the house and see where it goes. She, by, the end of the, by the end of the conversation, he sold me a dream and, uh, and uh, you know, said, look, I'd be able to offer you 50, uh, 50 pounds a week, I think it was, at that particular time. And I... I I suppose not. I didn't jump at it. I just sort of went in and says, okay, I'll see how it goes. It's not for me. I can always opt out. But, um, you know, it just, as it went on, Stephen is is very good at and you can see that at the moment with the setup within the Irish within the Irish first team. He gives lads an opportunity. He trusts in them and he knows that they'll do a job and he, he really gets behind you. You know, he Last that might be short and confident. Stephen is absolutely brilliant of bringing that back out of them and making them fall in love with football again. And you know that's who he is. He was always that way at Longford Town. He wasn't wasn't afraid to make difficult decisions either, um, but was always willing to give young young lads a chance. And which which was great. It was great for me because if he hadn't have sort of looked at me and said, okay, this is a possible opportunity here where he could have one and have a good League of Ireland career. If Stephen hadn't thought that, then I probably would have just fell by the wayside. Simple as that. Even how he, you know, as you said there, he brought you into the house. That was so meticulous in itself, you know, kind of bringing you into his domain where he can try and say, you know, this is what we're going to do, whether you yeah. like it or not. But looking back at the time and, would you would, would 22 or 23 year old Sean Plunty is would he have been surprised that Stephen Kenny rose to the level he's at now and as manager of Ireland? Um I always thought as as his, I think as his career progressed within management, you could see he was doing pretty good jobs, actually in some in some cases like excellent jobs in, in you know Dundalk, Derry City, um and Bohemians, where he went. Shamrock Rovers um, was probably the, on the flip side of that. It didn't really work out from there. But I remember we played against uh, Derry City when Stephen was manager, and Derry City could pull you to pieces if you weren't uh, if you weren't organised as a team. Very similar to uh, Bohemians as well. And uh, obviously, I never played against him when he was manager at Dundalk. But uh, you know, he 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 gave lads again who were probably. You know, they, they were excellent footballers or re- very good footballers. Stephen gave them the opportunity and they became excellent footballers and it, with huge success then to um, to Dundalk. So, you know, that's what he done. He, he built a solid base with good players who got even better and, and they brought the success as well. So I'm not surprised in a way that um, he is where he is. But some people probably are because of the history of the Irish football to either go and get somebody from the UK but it is great to see that he's been given an opportunity and a chance. Things didn't start off so well for him. And that's just down to, you know, the COVID situation, you know, it was just an absolute nightmare. Um, but, you know, you can see over the last, what, eight or nine games, what, what they're trying to do. Um, and I know people are saying, look, you need to, you know, it's a results business. Yeah, but like, what are you going to do? You're going to get rid of Steve and bring someone in and, you know, you're going to have to start from scratch again. You know, Irish football and international football, you know, has, has been in a, a difficult, you know, uh, position over the last number of years. We've got the tournaments, but we've got the tournaments. He haven't really performed, you know. Um, but I think with Stephen, what he's trying to do and is is really really good. And you just have to trust in the process. You know, you know, things don't change overnight. So you just have to trust in the process. Lads and players will. You know, uh, will come out and defend them. Um, but they, you can see in the performances that they put it against Portugal and over the last number of games, they're 
they look like a, a pretty solid unit. Once they get more confident, the more training sessions together and young blood comes through again. You know, I think we'll, I think he'll do very well, but I am delighted to see he's been given it the opportunity. And you go onto Twitter or you go on, on social media, and I think that's just the general consensus. There's a few people that just, you know, maybe they don't, he doesn't suit them, but you know, you're always going, you're not, you're always going to be fighting against that. He's essentially, you know, trying to, to change a culture with, with how the international setup is, which is what he did with Longford, really, when you look back at when he started and he came in as a young manager himself. And and he laid the foundation for a a period of success at the club that you were involved in, um, along with another manager, Alan Matthews, who came in after him. What what would you be? What would be your standout moment from your career at Longford? Obviously, there's two or three I could think of myself off the top of my head. But what what would your personal number one be? Uh, I think winning the winning the FAI Cup was was uh, was fantastic. The 2003 season that was that was absolutely brilliant because. We had a great, we had a really good squad. Alan Matthews and Aaron Callahan, who was the coach at the time, had a really strong squad. And like to get, I've said this so many times, to get on the actual bench was difficult enough. I remember playing games and looking up at the stand and there was lads like, you know, Paul Keegan would have been in the, in the stand. And Paul had a great career out in the US and, um, you know, a brilliant career here in Ireland. Things didn't work out for him when he came to Longford Town, but unfortunately, like he did score the vital goal in the 2004 uh, Cup final. But, um, you know, it was, it, uh, they, they just had a, a really good, they knew what they were doing. They had a good plan, solid, solid work ethic um, of players there that knew their jobs. And we were very, very difficult to beat. But I would say the 2000s, that, that Cup final, winning the Cup final for the first year, um, was absolutely fantastic, you know, because I got to my, my family were in the in the stands, my my grandparents were there as well. And but just the buzz that it brought to the town, you know, was absolutely huge. So to go back then and obviously win the cup final the following year uh, was great as well because you know you can win it once and be lucky, but when you have to go back again and uh, the second year, as far as I know, we I think we had repeats or re, uh, replays in most of the games. Mm. You know, it was a it was a difficult uh, to get to the cup final that year, I think we maybe played three uh, three replays. So um, you know, it that to, to win it the second year was was brilliant. But I the stand out for me was was the first. It was probably the first the FA I cup final. The buzz, as you said, around the town um, was massive. Like some of the footage of it at the time is brilliant. And, and one of the clips I always remember is your own mother being interviewed by Kieran. <laughs> I was on it. it out I, and and uh, just if you couldn't write it, you know, no. a local correspondent <laughs> at the time, and, and he, he just picks a random lady coming out of the ticket mm. boot and say not. Yeah. I hope my son will be able to play in the match. Oh, is that right? Yeah? Yes, I what's do. Your son, what's your son's name? Sean Pronto. Oh, very good, very good, very so, good. Yeah. He's getting blessed by uh, all holy saints now, and he's going to say no venus that he never said before. My son is playing, and, and she said she got the priest around to the house and everything for you ahead of the final. Yeah, yeah. So I was actually only looking at that video, believe it or not, about two to three weeks ago. Um, but I, 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 I'd always look at packet at, at, at all videos, and you know, even today on the WhatsApp group that I would have with um, Gary Casson and Alan Kerr, we were talking about the time Kerr scored the. Uh, the equaliser, or just the winner, I think the the winner or the equal the equaliser against Waterford in the two thousand and four cup final. But uh, yeah, it was it was just a, a huge buzz around around Lanford Town at the time. You know, you'd go down, you'd be walking down hills in the states, and you'd see the the red and black flags hanging out, people coming out chatting to you, um, and it was it was just really it was a, it was a purple patch for for us as a football team and for supporters as well. It was absolutely brilliant because. We were getting supporters traveling all over the country, traveling to European games as well, and um, the seas, which was brilliant. And for a team like Longford Town, who had been not not really the whipping boys of the League of Ireland for a number of years, but uh, you know, for us to be in a cup final and for I think six of we played in the time, my time at Longford Town, I think I played in six of the seven or six cup finals in seven years. Now we didn't obviously win all of them, but the fact that we were getting to cup finals. You know, it showed that there was a bit of um, a bite and a bit of DNA for us to be to go on and try and win. Unfortunately, you know, it would have been great to to win in a, a, a league, and I don't think we were all that far away. To be honest with you, it was just that Shells, Bowls, um, they were probably the two big teams, Cork City as well. You know, they had a lot more financial muscle than us um, back then, but it was uh, it was still a great time to be part of Longford Town. 
obviously your, your time with the town finished um, and, and a move to draw it materialized uh, who, who got that who got that going for you or, or how did that come about then uh, how it came about, we played Drogheda, I'll tell you this, this is actually a funny one, we played Drogheda in a, 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 it was either in a league match, or an, a, I think it was a league match, and they were going for the league at the time, and they brought in, they brought in Guy Bates, who literally went on a score, just scoring in every game when he, when he, when he came in, really good uh, striker, knew where the goal was, and Poulter could read, uh, you know, knew exactly where to be uh, when the ball was coming into the box. And thankfully for me, I had a pretty good game then uh, against Strahada. And I remember afterwards uh, speaking to, as I was walking off the pitch, I went up to Grand Garden and the guards and was saying, look, well done, you know, hopefully go on and win the league and so on. And he just says, uh, mate, you've earned it. You've earned it. Uh, you know, you'll be signing for Strahada next season after that performance. And I was like, oh. you know, you kind of just you say, he's like, yeah, I played, I played, I played okay. You know, um, but, you know, thankfully, you know, I did get the opportunity to play with, with Drogheda. Um, there was a, a, an opportunity to go to St. Pat's as well at the end of the season, um, and that just didn't materialise either. But, um, you know, Drogheda, for the, the short period of time I was there, like Paul Doolan, a top, top class manager, um, you know, was very, very, again, I suppose like Stephen Kenny, very meticulous, loved a good professional, but the setup in terms of, you know, training in the, in the morning time, gym sessions in the evening, or in the afternoon, it was exactly what I wanted. And it was actually just a pity that when I was at Longford Town, we didn't have the opportunity to go full time because I think if we had, you know, we would have been challenging for, we definitely would have been challenged for a league, you know, because the players that we had in the squad were fantastic footballers. Uh, we all knew our jobs um, and we still had something to prove as well. But, um, you know, the, the, the short period of time I had it, I tried it, it was, it was really good. I, I, I liked the, the the full-time aspect of, of football. Obviously then, uh, the big change happened. Um, you were diagnosed with a heart condition uh, not too too long into your draw of the United career. Um, tell us tell us how that came about or, or, or how you noticed um, something was going on. Well, I didn't actually, to be honest with you, I hadn't noticed anything. Um, there, was, there was a period of time before that when uh, I was at Lock, actually at Longford Town and I remember we were... We were playing a game and I was living in Selbridge with Alan Kirby at the time. So my pre-match would tend to be, OK, I'll go over to Liffey Valley and get some grub over there. But I remember at one particular point, I was just feeling like really dizzy. You know, felt like I was actually like having a stroke or a heart attack. I didn't know what it was. Um, and the sweat just started pumping out of me. Um, and it was within a short period of time, I was holding on to bookshelves and Easton's trying to, you know, I was trying to stand up and, you know, the sweat was like literally rolling down my face. But um, I put it, actually put it down to that I wasn't, uh, I hadn't eaten enough, mm. you know, so that's that's what I put it down to. Then the following season, I'd gone to Drogheda um, and done the, the necessary tests to get, you know, for to, to be signed. They were in the Champions League qualifiers. I had to be screened and heart screened. And um, they, they just picked up their, the abnormality in, in that I didn't. I actually didn't think there was anything wrong because even in the off season, I got the testing done. I went and I trained because I knew I was going to be playing with full time players who were full time over the course of the last number of the previous seasons. And I wanted to go in, and I didn't want to be going in out of shape. I wanted to be going in as fit as possible to try and challenge for a starting position within the squad or within the team, which was going to be difficult enough anyway. Um, you know, so I just needed to give my, myself the best opportunity opportunity to go in there be fit and um, you know and be as quick uh, as in terms of football quickness and, and thought quickness on the ball as, as the lads that were there uh, and then it was just we were due out to go through we were, due, we were going training on a I don't know, I think Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday morning and I got the phone call from Dr Alan Bourne who's the, the head doctor at the FBI now and he says look you need to go in and see the cardiologist the next morning and, and then the news he just broke the news to me um, you know that you know um, there was a significant issue with the heart and his recommendation was that I get some testing done and, you know, depending on the results, uh, I would possibly have to uh, retire from playing football. So, uh, yeah, that was that was it, that was very difficult. I, I actually met the cardiologist about maybe eight or nine months ago and he, he, he apologised the, for the way he broke the news to me, you know, um, because it was... It was it was just that's literally what he says, your career is over. And I hadn't got time. Back then. 
you know, yeah. So I hadn't, I, I couldn't process it. I was like 26, 27, 27, 28 at the time. Um, I just signed for Drada. Uh, they're the reigning champions. We're going to, into the Champions League and I was feeling flying fit. Uh, but yeah, so I got speaking to him in, uh, nine, 10 months ago, maybe a little bit longer actually. And he'd, um, he'd said, look, he apologised for the, the way the news is broken. But yeah, in fairness, Dr. Alan Bourne, um, you know, he pushed for heart screening, you know, you know, to this day, I, I owe my life, you know, because I done a talk with um, with RTE, I, I think it was that season, and Eamon Donahue uh, had done an, had, had brought had brought me in. He was he was doing the, the video of the of the actual interview, and we went in to meet Alan Bourne, and his question to Alan Bourne was like, "Well, what would have happened, Sean, if you hadn't had the, if you hadn't done the hard screening?" And he was like, "Well, we've been sp- speaking." About Sean rather than to Sean. Mm-hmm. So um, straight after that, I was uh, I was living at Alan Kirby in Selbridge, and I went back, and he was having his mid afternoon uh, nap as a as a full time footballer does, and he's just like, "Is everything all right?" And I walked into his room, I was like, "Just gives a hug, just gives a hug." I just gave, I just hooked it out with him, you know. That was it, you know. So uh, so that that was pretty much it. I think that was when I realised, you know, how lucky I was to um, to have obviously the, the the problem was was found. Um, and then subsequently, a couple of years then after, after having a, like a USB stick into the chest, um, they decided to put the pacemaker in. I can't imagine at the time, you know, as you said, 27, 28, full-time footballer, you know, in the prime of your life, to, to have that wall thrown in front of you. I can't imagine it was an easy few months or years immediately afterwards, you know, trying to deal with the fact that what you, you essentially had planned for the next possibly 10 years of, of football was gone in an instant. Yeah, it was, it was difficult to process because I was, I suppose, at the prime, 20, 27 years of age and was really looking forward to the next like three or four years of, of playing football professionally. Um, I never, I was always very professional, like even from like a, a young age, I was always like making sure I was fit and healthy and trying to understand the nutrition side of things so I could uh, perform and recover. But, you know, when, when I got when I was told that I could, like the best options to be to, to retire from the game, you know, I did, it took probably the guts of a, I'd say possibly two years to really get over that because you're always thinking, oh, I should be out playing. And, you know, you, you'd be thinking you should be preparing for games rather than, you know, you know, just not preparing for games. So that was really, that was really difficult. But in those circumstances, it's important to have a solid structure and support structure in and around you. And I was very lucky to have that because they were able to, you know, sometimes they might just check and say, yeah, okay, I might, I wouldn't be speaking to them that often because I, I definitely, um, you know, distanced myself from, from people I felt back then, but that was just out of not wanting to talk to people, didn't want to talk about the situation. Um, and it was just, I suppose, a mixture of emotions between, anger, upset, all of that. So um, it was it was important to have a solid and good support structure, family, friends around me. And luckily for me, you know, I, I always kind of, I stayed active anyway. So even it was like, I might go out for a cycle, go walking, whatever, go for a jog. I took up reading, all of that. So, you know, thankfully I opted for going that option. And as I've said so many times, I didn't go down and say, okay, right, I need to start drinking, you know, and drinking heavily. That wasn't the case because I, I wouldn't function. And, you know, for me, it was, I'd make bad decisions that way. So, um, yeah, it was, it was very difficult. It was, it was difficult for me. Obviously, it was very difficult for my family and, um, you know, very difficult for my mom, my dad, my sister, um, and also for my friends as well, because they, you know, Kerbs, for example, would have known, you know, how, how professional I was. And he, you know, when, when he, when I told him the news, he was actually an lecturer at the time, you know, so it was, it was, it was very difficult for all of my close friends and family because they were thinking of, okay, well, what could happen? And as again, I've said this so many times, I think my, I'd be, you know, I went through a stage of being scared to sleep in case I didn't wake up. And then when I did go to sleep, I, I was my brother-in-law had said, you know, he says, oh, you know, your dad goes in and checks on you. He says, he puts his ear to your mouth to make sure you're breathing. I didn't know that. So when I heard that, I was like, Jesus Christ, poor dad, you know, think, thinking these, these terrible thoughts. So, um, yeah, it was just going through, I suppose, a mixture of emotions. Um, and thankfully, look, I'm at the situation now where I'm, you know, I suppose, have a job, 
fit, still able to train, have a family. Um, but I can look back at that. It was a, definitely a challenging point in time, but you learn so much from those uh, parts of your life or your career um, that you can help going forward for various different types of challenges that you may face down the line. Do you think what happened with the diagnosis and how life played out has, has kind of contributed to the person you became after that, you know, in terms of off the pitch as who you are as a man? Yeah, definitely. 100% because you, I've, I've said that like you don't know what sort of individual you are until you go to, through something that's really difficult, you know, but the only, the only option is either to face it or else not face it, you know, and, and, and that was, trust me, that was it, that was it, that was a possible choice for me back then, you know, because I felt that it was, I was getting nowhere. I had like a support, I'd got the support, thankfully, from um, Stephen McGuinness and the PFEI. Which was which was really good. That he was able to guide me, give me some guidance, and you know, poor Stephen, you know, he was going, he's going through his own uh, his own, um, you know, uh, health issues at, at the moment as well. But uh, it's just, it was, it was, it was definitely very, very tough. But what you, what I went through has has helped me today. You know, in you know, for any any situation that that comes through, and where I'm at in terms of my job at the moment. You know, working with uh, Connecticut Sports, who were a sports nutrition company. Like the the reason I got that job was that I had to apply for a I had to apply for a for a, a, an interview, and one of the questions on it was like name it a difficult part of your career, um, or a challenging point in your career where you um you know where you were, that you faced and how you came through it. And straight away, that was, you know, that was my example. So uh, after doing some interviews, thankfully, in the end, that was 2011, I think it was, I got the job with, with Connecticut Sports and I'm, I'm still here today. So things work in, in various different ways. And, you know, for me, one door closed, another door opened. And, you know, thankfully, I'm in a, in a role now that I absolutely love working in. We will just touch on that. Obviously, you're with Connecticut now uh, nine years or, or 10 years now. Um, yeah. And... and Obviously, you've worked your way up the ladder uh, through various positions. But t- talk to us about that job. Obviously, you went from playing in sport to now working, you know, in the nutritional side of things. Talk about what, what, what you're doing there and what you're what you're hoping to achieve with them. Yeah, so um, after retiring from football, um, as I said, I, I, I got a job working as, a, I suppose, an, an internship, really working with Connecticut Sports over in the UK. So I was based over there, I think, for about two years moved back to Ireland and, and thankfully was made full-time then uh, to 2013. So I've worked my way up and I've always had an interest in nutrition and that goes back to when I was over at Middlesbrough um, as, as a kid, you know, I'd always look at what, what food they put out and always asking questions. So, you know, that area always fascinated me. And, you know, if I can't play football professionally, the next best option for me was to, you know, work in an environment or where there was nutrition involved, or health and wellness and fitness. So uh, with Connecticut Sports, it's been it's been absolutely brilliant. So uh, I've got a qualification as a performance nutritionist. I work with them on the partnership side of things. So we've got a, a, a you know really good team within 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 Connecticut. Everyone is uh, you know, like I suppose not not everyone is mad about sport, but we have that interest in sport and challenging um, ourselves as individuals and as a brand as well. So. I work with a close team within the brand team um, and, and also the, the, the wider sales team as well uh, and, and help out on the nutrition side of things. So it's a, it's a fascinating area. It changes constantly, you know, every single year, but it's, a, it's one that you try to, you stay on top of, but it's, it's as I said, it's, um, you know, it's, it's such a, a great area to be in um, because you're learning constantly. And when you're speaking to people, you're able to give them advice on, you know, how to perform better during a game, how to recover better after a game. And these things weren't around within the League of Ireland when I was playing. You know, you were doing a lot of the reading yourself. But thankfully now, there's some excellent uh, nutritionists out there who are trying to make, you know, players perform better, recover better, and also longevity when it comes to uh, playing the sport. You seem to be more active now than, than as a player. You know, if, if anyone was to look on, on your Instagram or, you know, you'd see mountain biking, running... Yeah. And, Hike and you know you're you're essentially an outdoorsman at this stage. The only thing you're short of is just pitching the tent up overnight. Um, yeah, that'll happen. How, Don't worry, that'll that happen. About you know, obviously from being diagnosed with a heart condition to stopping sport to nearly reinventing yourself essentially and and getting to possibly the fittest you've ever been 
and, and being outdoors and, and enjoying yourself on the weekends off work. How, how did how did you get into all that type of stuff? Um, I, like, I was always interested in fitness anyway, but I think with football, you're you're consumed. I was one of those guys that was football, football, football. Everything else was just like by the wayside, like relationships, anything like that. You know, I was always focused on football. Um, but I think when I retired, you know, you begin to see there's more, there's there is more important things out there than football. You know, um, and just I, I just had a graph for the mountain running, um, enjoyed it, went out, absolutely loved it. Found like I was a different person once I was up in the mountains. You know, you're you're free of. You know stress everything like that and you can have your you're with your own thoughts as well and then i suppose i've done a lot of uh, like mountain running mountain events um adventure racing and, and then over the last period of time we've decided or I've, I've just taken a, a love for mountain biking so it's it's these challenges as well that you you know you kind of i have a fear of you know i think of a fear of not being able to do something you know unfortunately i'm not getting any younger but I want to try different things. I want to challenge myself. And it all goes back to that challenge of, okay, can you do it? No, let's try and see if you can do it. And um, so you, you want to, you want to challenge yourself. And again, you're, you're trying to be a good role model for your, for your kids as well. So, you know, when, if, if one of my little lads says, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. You know, it's, it's those trying to instill in them. Okay. You can do it, try it and, and, and try and persist with it. But um, yeah, I just love being, I love being outdoors. I love being active. I love the, the thought of being healthy as well. Uh, like it's not going to last forever. So I might as well try and do it as, as much as possible. And that's why working with, with Connecticut Sports is brilliant. Like we've we've signed up to do a race from uh, Mizzenhead to Mallonhead in in June, I think it is, or July. Uh, yeah, fi- uh, in July. So I'm not a cyclist by any means, but it's going to be difficult work. You're going to have to, and, and myself and one of the other guys, Bailey, uh, we're definitely not cyclists, whereas two of the other chaps are brilliant cyclists. So, you know, we, we've already put pressure on ourselves, or I have on myself, of, okay, trying to perform. But you'll do the work and, and you you know, you'll try and get a good base, solid base of training in. Um, and that's what it is. It's just challenging yourself on, on co- constantly to, to try and improve as either as an individual within work or as a, as a sports person you know, that you want to be as active as possible. I want to be able to run around my kids when I'm like 60 years of age or 70 years of age. Um, and that's part of the reason that drives me. You know, I want to be healthy. I want to be able to do it. And when I am healthy, I'm like, I'm, I'm in good mood. If I'm injured, I'm an absolute nightmare. So, um, you know, for that period of time when I had the heart condition or when I was going through that, uh, that phase, uh, I was a nightmare to be around, you know, I was up and down. I was like all over the place. So, emotionally I wasn't uh, I definitely wasn't centered do you think obviously in hindsight now you you can look back footballers back then you know there, there was probably not the right mechanisms in place for for players to deal with something like that you know which is essentially a traumatic event you know in their life nowadays obviously you know players are they, they have a good you know support system in place with in terms of you know, their family, their, their friends, obviously, as well. But the clubs themselves have kind of put mechanisms to help support players nowadays. But at the time, do you feel they weren't, you know, where they should have been? Yeah, like, it's, it's, look, it was it was very, defi- I, yes, definitely, that I, I would agree with you on that. Things have changed. Things, um, you know, um, various parts of the clubs have, have changed and improved a huge amount because there's so much on... Um, mental health issues in, in this country and possibly even more now with, with COVID, you know, so uh, clubs have to be aware of the health and well-being of an actual player because y- your career as a footballer is very short. So, you know, if you don't have injuries and you can, you know, c- keep on, on playing until you're 35 or 36 or whatever, brilliant. But if your career, if you're a young kid at 18 or 19 and you get a career end an injury at 21, 22, um, a club needs to be there to be able to support you and tell you exactly what, okay, your, your career is over. Let's see what we can do to, for you on, on an educational front um, or on a job front. So they definitely have improved um, because, you know, the last thing I hate seeing stories of, you know, uh, whether it be a soccer player, a uh, GAA player or, or what any sport, they have to retire from injury and they don't have the support because, you know, they, they, they're dealing with a death of their career then they have to try and face a new career, learn a whole new skill set possibly, um, and then try and earn money 
So, um, you know, they're trying to rebuild themselves once their career is over, but it, de- it has improved. I think there's more of a focus on it. Uh, social media as well. It can be positive, it can be negative. But when it comes to, um, you know, promotion of mental health, I know there's some fantastic people out there that are, are um, you know, really on, the, on, on uh, you know, trying to drive awareness of issues around mental health. So when you have those people, you know, pushing it and, and you know, trying to create awareness around it, Government football clubs are all going to uh, are all going the way in behind. Are you at least hope so? I've noticed maybe maybe in the last year or two, maybe it's just social media and the news. There seems to be more of an emergence of heart problems within the football community, or else maybe they're just being picked up more with technology advancements and everything else. I suppose the biggest one I can recall. Um, I suppose Aubameyang was sent home from from the African Cup of Nations with, with heart lesions. I read last week, but. Ericsson in, in, in the summer, I'd say something like that probably wasn't easy for you to read, never mind see if you hadn't been watching the game at the time. Yeah, it's, um, I, was, I actually wasn't watching the game at the time. I was, I think I was at the back doing the garden, so I'm getting old when I'm out the back doing the garden. Um, and it was my wife who came out to me and said uh, that the game has been called off. There's been an issue with one of the players. And I just went, oh, Jesus. So it's straight away, it, I was like, oh no, I knew what was I knew what was going to happen. But I've I know play, it's happened players in the the years after uh, I retired. And the first when when I read about it, you know, you'd uh, you'd, you'd always be you, you sort of sink back into this negative area, which I absolutely hated. I think for Brees Mwamba when that happened, uh, him. Uh, like a number of years ago and I remember going home and my mom bawling crying on the couch because she she was thinking like oh that could have been me but with, with Ericsson that was de- that was definitely a, it was difficult I have coping mechanisms there you know when when something like that happens I try and just you know I suppose take my mind off it and, and, and focus on the positives and that's you know that's exactly what I do and you know and thankfully I've got a like a I've a good job I've got like a, a great family um, and you know I've got good friends, everything like that. So, you know, that's what I try and focus on is the, is the positive side of things. But uh, yeah, it, it definitely wasn't, it wasn't easy um, because, you know, I can't, I can't even imagine what his teammates or obviously himself and his close family would have been going through at the time. You're a positive person. Um, anyone that knows you says that now. Um, yeah. <laughs> how would you, or, or what would you say to the younger players coming up that, you know, are, are getting knocked back, not in terms of injury, but, you know, they're, they're not making teams or they're, they're getting dropped or things like that. What would you say to them for their mentality, you know, on, on how to keep going and, and pick themselves up? Yeah, I think it's, you, you can look at it as in, you know, you, you don't make a team, you don't get, you know, you, you don't make it over in the UK like happened to me, um, or you, you go for so many trials and it just doesn't happen for you. And that can be demoralising, but... You know, if you've got, as I said, your, your support structure, which I did, my, my mom and dad and everyone like that around me, you know, they're saying, OK, look, at that's done. What did you learn from it? OK, how can you improve the next time? And you use that as a catalyst, really, to, um, I suppose, to prove people wrong. You know, and I, like I'd been, I'd been over in trial and didn't, didn't make it over in the UK. Thankfully, I got the opportunity to go to Middlesbrough. But even at Longford Town and, you know, when I first, when Alan Matches first came in at, at Longford Town, you know, like I wasn't one of the players that Alan would play, you know, every every week. And you, you either go, OK, well, that's grand. I'll move on and, and, and so on. So be it. But you have to have something about you as well. That, OK, look, at this person literally doesn't think, you know, I'm not saying Alan didn't, but I wasn't playing. So he didn't think I was good enough to be in the first 11, which is absolutely fine. That's the manager's choice. But for me, I was like, OK, I am good enough, but maybe I need to change something about what I'm doing. So that could be my fitness it could be my nutrition side of things. So there was an area there where I had to look at myself as a, as, a, as a player and see where I needed to improve. But also I had it in the back of my mind, okay, I actually want to prove this person wrong, you know, of, um, you know, that I, I am good enough to play in the team. And it took a long time for me to, to, to get back into the Lamford Town first team. I couldn't get, I couldn't, I remember turning up to an under 21 game and Dennis O'Brien coming over to me and going, look, you're, you're not in the squad. And I was like, what? I was like, you're joking me. And he's like, no, no, you're not in the squad. So that was a real kick in the nuts for me. But it was a, it was a, you know, you kind of go, well, okay, that's absolutely fine. Where do I need to improve? You know, you just have to, you, you can't have an ego. You know, you just have to get down and do the dirty work. And um, no matter how ugly it is, 
you just get down, you grind, and uh, hopefully that's your chance uh, it comes about. And thankfully for me, it did. You know, um, I got into the team. We played, I think, Derry City in a, a League Cup final. And I, I think that was, um, that would have been in 2002. And from then on, I was just, I, I thankfully, I, I played in, in the majority of games um, when, well, while Alan was manager, you know. And I've got great friends now with Alan. And like, like only for Alan, I wouldn't have, uh, FAI Cup final medals or anything like that, and you know it's um you know he 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 helped me get those medals there. Managers managers don't always get on with the players and vice versa, but there's a common ground there when you okay I need to perform, he needs to tell me you know, I'm doing good enough and I need to up my game. Um, but yeah, you're you're just gonna have those various challenges in life. So for any young player, and apologies if I'm rambling on here, any young player that's knocked back a little bit, what you do is you just sort of focus on. The positives try and improve and again always have in the back of your mind okay i need to prove some people wrong not an aggressive tone but or not an aggressive way but uh you know just go down and, and, and get the work done i'll put you on the spot here with uh, the final question um, right. Any any regrets do i have any regrets um this is quite an interesting one because we only spoke about this uh, within uh, a whatsapp group there with alan Kirby and gary Casson, who would have played goalkeeper at longford town but um we yeah we did i i i kind of have regrets about giving up the opportunity of of england a, a little too quickly you know uh i I was very, very homesick when I was over in the UK, even though it's across, only across the water. Uh, but I was, I was still quite like I was 16, 17 when I went over. Um, but I would have, lo- I would have loved another crack at the UK. Um, aside from that, you know, the UK didn't work out for me, but I actually had a really good career in the League of Ireland. So you know, I, I'll take the positive. You know, and and you know, I, I could have had a, a, a good career in in the UK, not won anything. Uh, but I, thankfully, I've come back and I came back and. You know, had a good career within the League of Ireland, albeit short, but I, I was, you know, won some medals with Longford Town and gave the fans a, a decent day out, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, you, there, there are some regrets, but at the same time, you can't, I don't, I don't dwell on them. I, I possibly would have dwelled on them years and years ago, um, but not now. I says there, there's, there, you know, I, have to, I always like, try, I like to focus on the positive um, rather than just thinking um, about what could have been. It's in the past, so I just move on from it. Lastly, uh, your testimonial, an emotional day or something you don't look back on too much now because it was so soon after. Um, I, I actually didn't want one, to be honest with you. It was, um, I, I, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I actually didn't want it. It was like, no, I don't want it. Um, but it was, I do look back on it. My sister, I actually have a, a photo album of that particular day. And um, I was, my niece, who is now 13, I think 13 years of age, she, she was the, the, the baby I carried out onto the, onto the pitch that night. Obviously, she can't remember a thing of it. But um, yeah, I, I, like I look back at it and, you know, it was like, that was it. That was the chapter finished of my football career. So it was nice to kind of have closure. Um, and I got to play with lads that I had, you know, like Paul McNally, uh, Stewie Bourne, um, Digger O'Brien, you know, Stephen Kenny was there as well. Um, Alan Matthews and like the supporters as well so yeah it was it was great to have it and it was great to be recognized you know to you know by the fans that came out but also your ex-teammates because you know you're always trying to prove to yourself and obviously the fans but you have to prove to your teammates that you're you're also good enough um, and the fact that the the guys turned up um, you know it was it was great and just to catch up with them again uh, was was fantastic because we had some great teammates. We had some fantastic players at Longford Town. Like people forget the, the quality of players that we had um, at Longford Town that, that Stephen Kenny brought down, and um, but that Alan Matches brought in as well. So uh, it was it was a fantastic time for for the club to, to be in part of like cup finals and so on and have that bit of success. But for me, then once it once I retired, you know, and, and had that testimonial, that was basically you know, closing the chapter of my football career and, and then trying to focus on studies because I went in and was studying it and at Lone IT at that particular time. Sean, uh, it's been great chatting to you. Great getting to, to get a little more insight into how you're doing and how the football <laughs> career went. Um, I'm sure the, the, the viewers will be appreciative of your time as well. So uh, thanks very much. We'll hopefully see you in Bishop's Gate soon. 
Yeah, no problem at all, James. Look, thanks a million for having me on and best of luck to Longford Town and to Gary um, as well for uh, for the upcoming season. I'm hoping it's a successful one. Cheers, Sean.